Welcome back to Classic Stories and Fairy Tales. I'm your host and narrator, Jerry Coble, and we are continuing in the book The Marvelous Land of Oz by L. Frank Baum. And today we start with a highly magnified history. It is but honest that I should acknowledge at the beginning of my recital that I was born an ordinary wogglebug, began the creature in a frank and friendly tone. Knowing no better, I used my arms as well as my legs for walking and crawled into the edges of stones or hid among the roots of grasses with no thought beyond finding a few insects smaller than myself to feed upon. The chill nights rendered me stiff and motionless, for I wore no clothing, but each morning the warm rays of the sun gave me new life and restored me to activity. A horrible existence is this, but you must remember it is the regular ordained existence of wogglebugs, as well as of many other tiny creatures that inhabit the earth. But destiny had singled me out, humbled though I was, for a grander fate. One day, I crawled near to a country schoolhouse, and my curiosity being excited by the monotonous hum of the students within, I made bold to enter and creep along a crack between two boards until I reached the far end where, in front of a hearth of glowing embers, sat the master at his desk. No one noticed so small a creature as a wogglebug, and when I found that the hearth was even warmer and more comfortable than the sunshine, I resolved to establish my future home beside it. So I found a charming nest between two bricks and hid myself therein for many, many months. Professor Know-It-All is, doubtless, the most famous scholar in the land of Oz, and after a few days I began to listen to the lectures and discourses he gave his pupils. Not one of them was more attentive than the humble, unnoticed Wogglebug, and I acquired in this way a fund of knowledge that I will myself confess is simply marvelous. That is why I place T.E. thoroughly educated upon my cards, for my greatest pride lies in the fact that the world cannot produce another Wogglebug with a tenth part of my own culture and erudition. I do not blame you, said the Scarecrow. Education is a thing to be proud of. I am educated myself. The mess of brains given me by the great wizard is considered by my friends to be unexcelled. Nevertheless, interrupted the tin woodman, a good heart is, I believe, much more desirable than education or brains. To me, said the sawhorse, a good leg is more desirable than either. Could seeds be considered in the light of brains, inquired the pumpkin head abruptly. Keep quiet, commanded Tip sternly. Very well, dear father, answered the obedient Jack. The Wogglebug listened patiently, even respectfully, to these remarks and then resumed his story. I must have lived fully three years in that secluded schoolhouse hearth, said he, drinking thirstily of the ever-flowing fount of limpid knowledge before me. Quite poetical, commented the Scarecrow, nodding his head approvingly. But one day, continued the Bug, a marvelous circumstance occurred that altered my very existence and brought me to my present pinnacle of greatness. The professor discovered me in the act of crawling across the hearth, and before I could escape, he had caught me between his thumb and forefinger. My dear children, said he, I have captured a wogglebug, a very rare and interesting specimen. Do any of you know what a wogglebug is? No, yelled the scholars in chorus. Then, said the professor, I will get out my famous magnifying glass and throw the insect upon a screen in a highly magnified condition that you may all study carefully its peculiar construction, become acquainted with its habits and manner of life. He then brought from a cupboard a most curious instrument, and before I could realize what had happened, I found myself thrown upon a screen in a highly magnified state, even as you now behold me. The students stood up on their stools and craned their heads forward to get a better view of me, and two little girls jumped upon the sill of an open window where they could see more plainly. Behold, cried the professor in a loud voice, this highly magnified wogglebug, one of the most curious insects in existence. Being thoroughly educated and knowing what is required of a cultured gentleman, at this juncture I stood upright and placing my hand upon my bosom made a very polite bow. My action, being unexpected, must have startled them, for one of the little girls perched upon the window sill gave a scream and fell backward out of the window, drawing her companion with her as she disappeared. The professor uttered a cry of horror and rushed away through the door to see if the poor children were injured by the fall. 
The scholars followed after him in a wild mob, and I was left alone in the schoolroom, still in a highly magnified state and free to do as I pleased. It immediately occurred to me that this was a good opportunity to escape. I was proud of my great size and realized that now I could safely travel anywhere in the world. While my superior culture would make me a fit associate for the most learned person I might chance to meet. So while the professor picked the little girls, who were more frightened than hurt, off the ground, and the pupils clustered around him closely grouped, I calmly walked out of the schoolhouse, turned a corner, and escaped unnoticed to a grove of trees that stood near. Wonderful! exclaimed the pumpkin head admiringly. It was indeed, agreed the Wogglebug. I have never ceased to congratulate myself for escaping while I was highly magnified, for even my excessive knowledge would have proved of little use to me had I remained a tiny, insignificant insect. I didn't know before, said Tip, looking at the Wogglebug with a puzzled expression, that insects wore clothes. Nor do they, in their natural state, returned the stranger, but in the course of my wanderings I had the good fortune to save the ninth life of a tailor, tailors having, like cats, nine lives, as you probably know. The fellow was exceedingly grateful, for had he lost that ninth life, it would have been the end of him, so he begged permission to furnish me with the stylish costume I now wear. It fits very nicely, does it not? And the Wogglebug stood up and turned himself around slowly that all might examine his person. He must have been a good tailor, said the Scarecrow somewhat enviously. He was a good-hearted tailor at any rate, observed Nick Chopper. But where were you going when you met us? Tip asked the Wogglebug. Nowhere in particular was the reply, although it is my intention soon to visit the Emerald City and arrange to give a course of lectures to select audiences of the advantages of magnification. We are bound for the Emerald City now, said the Tin Woodman, so if it pleases you to do so, you are welcome to travel in our company. The Wogglebug bowed with profound grace. It will give me great pleasure, said he, to accept your kind invitation, for nowhere in the land of Oz could I hope to meet with so congenial a company. That is true, acknowledged the pumpkin head. We are quite as congenial as flies and honey. But pardon me if I seem inquisitive. Are you not all rather... <clears throat> rather unusual, asked the Wogglebug, looking from one to another with unconcealed interest. Not more so than you yourself, answered the Scarecrow. Everything in life is unusual until you get accustomed to it. What rare philosophy, exclaimed the Wogglebug admiringly. Yes, my brains are working well today, admitted the Scarecrow, an accent of pride in his voice. Then, if you are sufficiently rested and refreshed, let us bend our steps toward the Emerald City, suggested the magnified one. We can't, said Tip. The sawhorse has broken a leg, so he can't bend his steps, and there is no wood around to make him a new limb from, and we can't leave the horse behind because the pumpkin head is so stiff in the joints that he has to ride. How very unfortunate, cried the Wogglebug. Then he looked the party over carefully and said, If the pumpkin head is to ride, why not use one of his legs to make a leg for the horse that carries him? I judge that both are made of wood. Now, that is what I call real cleverness, said the Scarecrow approvingly. I wonder my brains did not think of that long ago. Get to work, my dear Nick, and fit the pumpkin head's leg to the sawhorse. Jack was not especially pleased with this idea, but he submitted to having his left leg amputated by the tin woodman and whittled down to fit the left leg of the sawhorse. Nor was the sawhorse especially pleased with the operation either, for he growled a good deal about being butchered, as he called it, and afterward declared that the new leg was a disgrace to a respectable sawhorse. I beg you to be more careful in your speech, said the pumpkin head sharply. Remember, if you please, that is my leg you are abusing. I cannot forget it, retorted the sawhorse, for it is quite as flimsy as the rest of your person. Flimsy? Me flimsy? cried Jack in rage. How dare you call me flimsy? Because you are built as absurdly as a jumping jack, sneered the horse, rolling his naughty eyes in a vicious manner. Even your head won't stay straight, and you never can tell whether you are looking backwards or forwards. Friends, I entreat you not to quarrel, pleaded the tin woodman anxiously. As a matter of fact, we are none of us above criticism, so let us bear with each other's faults. An excellent suggestion, said the Wogglebug approvingly. You must have an excellent heart, my metallic friend. 
I have, returned Nick, well pleased. My heart is quite the best part of me, but now let us start upon our journey. They perched the one-legged pumpkin head upon the sawhorse and tied him to his seat with cords so that he could not possibly fall off. And then, following the lead of the scarecrow, they all advanced in the direction of the Emerald City. Old Mombi indulges in witchcraft. They soon discovered that the sawhorse limped for his new leg was a trifle too long, so they were obliged to halt while the tin woodman chopped it down with his axe, after which the wooden steed paced along more comfortably, but the sawhorse was not entirely satisfied even yet. It was a shame that I broke my other leg, it growled. On the contrary, airily remarked the wogglebug, who was walking alongside, you should consider the accident most fortunate, for a horse is never of much use until he has been broken. I beg your pardon, said Tip, rather provoked, for he felt a warm interest in both the sawhorse and his man Jack. But permit me to say that your joke is a poor one, and as old as it is poor. Still, it is a joke, declared the wogglebug firmly, and a joke derived from a play upon words is considered among educated people to be eminently proper. What does that mean? inquired the pumpkin head stupidly. It means, my dear friend, explained the wogglebug, that our language contains many words having a double meaning, and that to pronounce a joke that allows both meanings of a certain word proves the joker a person of culture and refinement, who has, moreover, a thorough command of the language. I don't believe that, said Tip plainly. Anybody can make a pun. Not so, rejoined the wogglebug stiffly. It requires education of a higher order. Are you educated, young sir? Not especially, admitted Tip. Then you cannot judge the matter. I myself am thoroughly educated, and I say that puns display genius. For instance, were I to ride upon the sawhorse, he would not only be an animal, he would become an equipage, for he would then be a horse and buggy. At this the scarecrow gave a gasp, and the tin woodman stopped short and looked reproachfully at the wogglebug. At the same time, the sawhorse loudly snorted his derision, and even the pumpkin head put up his hands to hide the smile which, because it was carved upon his face, he could not change to a frown. But the wogglebug strutted along as if he had made some brilliant remark, and the scarecrow was obliged to say, I have heard, my dear friend, that a person can become overeducated, and although I have a high respect for brains, no matter how they may be arranged or classified, I begin to suspect that yours are slightly tangled. In any event, I must beg you to restrain your superior education while in our society. We are not very particular, added the tin woman, and we are exceedingly kind-hearted. But if your superior culture gets leaky again, he did not complete the sentence, but he twirled his gleaming axe so carelessly that the wogglebug looked frightened and shrank away to a safe distance. The others marched on in silence, and the highly magnified one after a period of deep thought, said in a humble voice, I will endeavor to restrain myself. That is all we can expect, returned the scarecrow pleasantly, and good nature being thus happily restored to the party, they proceeded upon their way. When they again stopped to allow Tip to rest, the boy being the only one that seemed to tire, the tin woodman noticed many small round holes in the grassy meadow. This must be a village of the field mice, he said to the scarecrow, I wonder if my old friend, the queen of the mice, is in this neighborhood. If she is, she may be of great service to us, answered the scarecrow, who was impressed by a sudden thought. See if you can call her, my dear Nick. So the tin woodman blew a shrill note upon a silver whistle that hung around his neck, and presently a tiny gray mouse popped from a nearby hole and advanced fearlessly toward them, for the tin woodman had once saved her life, and the queen of the field mice knew he was to be trusted. Good day, your majesty, said Nick, politely addressing the mouse. I trust you are enjoying good health. Thank you. I am quite well, answered the queen demurely, as she sat up and displayed the tiny golden crown upon her head. Can I do anything to assist my old friends? You can indeed, replied the scarecrow eagerly. Let me, I entreat you, take a dozen of your subjects with me to the Emerald City. Will they be injured in any way? asked the queen doubtfully. I think not, replied the scarecrow. I will carry them hidden in the straw which stuffs my body, and when I give them the signal by unbuttoning my jacket, they have only to rush out and scamper home again as fast as they can. By doing this, they will assist me to regain my throne, which the army of revolt has taken from me. In that case, said the queen, I will not refuse your request. 
Whenever you are ready, I will call twelve of my most intelligent subjects. I'm ready now, returned the scarecrow. Then he lay flat upon the ground and unbuttoned his jacket. To